You're listening to Be Kind Rewind with Tim Nidell, taking you back to when movies were actually good. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? When music wasn't auto tune, when TV only had a few channels. And now, here's your host, Tim Nidell. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of Beacon Rewind with Tim Nadell, which is me, of course. And welcome to 2021. Ah, I can't believe we actually uh, survived 2020. Um, suck a year, I know, but let's look toward the future right now and, and try to make 2021 a better year, which I'm I'm trying to do. I don't know about you guys, but I'm trying to make it a better year, not only for the podcasts that I do, but, you know, my life, family, and everything like that try to make it a better year so hopefully you do that as well of course make sure to check me out online it's timnidale.com check out my other podcast saturday morning rewind it's at saturdaymorningrewind.com and of course this show is part of the phoenix media the future of broadcasting make sure to like them on facebook and check out their website really awesome guys really awesome shows on theirs you will not regret it one other thing, make sure to check out my YouTube channel. Just type in my name, Tim Nidell, or just go to my website, timnidell.com. Find all the links right there. I think you'll really enjoy it. I, I got a lot of vlog videos, travel videos, celebrity interviews, convention trips, Disney trips, travel videos. A lot of cool stuff on there, especially if you're like 80s and 90s retro things. I got some retro videos that I've made over the years and am still making nowadays. So go check that out. Type my name in, Tim Nidell, and you'll find me. But yeah, as I mentioned earlier in my intro, I do another show called Saturday Morning Rewind where I, I, I go back and I interview voice actors that I grew up loving, you know, from cartoons and movies that I adored as a kid. And I'm going to play one for you guys. It's with Lou Hirsch, who was the voice of Baby Herman from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which is easily one of my all-time favorite movies. I remember when I was a kid. I remember when it came out. I think it was eight. Maybe it was nine. I don't remember. And uh, my parents took me to the theater, and my brother and I just were just at all with the movie. And it wasn't until years later when I found out my mom really wanted to take us from the movie because it was a little raunchier than uh, she thought it would be. But she, you know, she saw us enjoying ourselves and having fun with the movie. So we stayed in the movie, and I'm glad we did because that experience was amazing. The theater, uh, still one of my all-time favorite movies. I watch it at least once a year. It's it still holds up today. I mean, that animation, the acting, just remarkable. So here is episode 174 of Saturday Morning Rewind, my interview with Lou Hirsch. Enjoy. First, thank you so very much for this. Big fan of your work as Baby Herman. I got to say that movie is still in probably my top five of all time movies. Well, I, I'm I'm very flattered that first that you have such a long memory because it's so long ago now, uh, I know. Uh, and I, I'm I'm flattered that uh, people uh, uh, still reach out to me. I mean, I, I, after all these years, I, I still get fan mail. I, I still get requests for for you know signed photos and oh. stuff. It just it just amazes me. I I, um, I never thought when I did the job that. 30 years on, yeah. I'd still be talking about it. Yeah, that's insane, isn't it? Have you ever thought about doing conventions to, to sign autographs and everything? Uh, you know, well, nobody's actually ever asked me to go and do a convention. I mean, I, I just don't know how much um, interest my being there would generate, really. Hmm. I mean, uh, um, uh, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I have a couple of friends that do them. Um, uh, not uh, um, One of my... Uh, friends from long long time ago uh who i went to drama school with in uh in the uk uh was is a young lady by the name of marina sirtis who played uh, deanna troy in uh, star trek next generation of course of course yeah and um i believe she does you know sort of star trek conventions mm -hmm. and stuff like that and uh, um so going back to your question no, no nobody's ever asked me <laughs> well you know what something's got to change about that <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if somebody sends me an email and says, are you interested in doing this? And I mean, if it's, you know, uh, uh, I, I certainly, I guess I would consider it, but uh -huh. I, I don't even know what it entails. I don't know, what, you know, <laughs> so. Well, I, I would hope to meet up and get a signed autograph from you at some point, because that would be amazing. 
It would it would be a pleasure. So our show is all about going back and reliving your childhood. That's why I'm talking to you. You were a big part of my childhood because I think Roger Rabbit is one of my earlier memories of going to the theater and watching a movie. I was eight years old when it came out, and I was just drawn to that screen. I found out years later that my mom and dad wanted to uh, pull us out of the theater, but they were afraid that we were going to, you know, get too upset that we were being taken out. I guess maybe some Jessica Rabbit stuff. I don't know what the deal was. Yeah. But but, uh, tell me a little bit about your childhood. What kind of stuff did you do as a kid? You say that, I mean, like you say that uh, uh, your first experience of, of uh, uh, Roger Rabbit was, was in a movie theater. Mm-hmm. I, I, my very first, my memory of going to a movie theater and seeing a, um, a, a movie that made a massive impression on me was uh, going to see The Wizard of Oz. Of course, a great one, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm not... I'm not that old, <laughs> but but, but uh, I remember being, I think, uh, probably maybe five or six years old, going to the movie theater, and it was when they still showed that movie in the movie theaters, mm-hmm. and me being uh, absolutely fascinated with it all, and, and uh, um, I remember, I, I, I have a, such a, a abiding memory of the scene when they're all in the wizard's chamber, and uh, uh, he tells them he wants them to bring back the the broom of the wicked witch. Mm-hmm. And and, um, he, and the lion says to him, he says, "But what if she kills us first? And then he says, "I said go." And the lion runs down all and he dives out the window. At five or six years old, I remember just convulsing with laughter. It, it, it's one of my abiding memories, as you say that you know when you saw. Roger Rabbit in, in the cinema. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. This is Mario Andretti. You know me as a race car driver, but I'm also a Meals on Wheels volunteer. I've raced against the sport's biggest personalities, but I've never met more vibrant, amazing people than the seniors served by Meals on Wheels. You can make a difference by dropping off a hot meal and saying a quick hello. So, America, Let's do lunch. Volunteer your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals and Wheels America and the Ad Council. People been saying to your friend, get a different face. And posting on their feed, they're super ugly. The things they say to them online are cruel and they're not true. So tell your friend, I'll stand up for you. someone being bullied online you can be a witness and make a difference by letting the world know it isn't cool and by letting your friend know you care learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org brought to you by the ad council hope you enjoyed your meal and i just want to say he's lucky to have a brother like you lucky caring for my brother is far from easy but he's a part of me like my arms and legs so i'll be his no time for tired nothing can disable this love he needs me but i'm the lucky one even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Most of my family, they never graduated high school, so I'm trying to break that barrier. My daughter Brooklyn was also a motivation for me to go back to school. Every day after work, went straight to school, and it paid off. At age 26, Kareem finished his high school diploma. I could not have done it alone. I see the future is really bright for me. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese. And guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. What if I told you that a tornado was going to happen tomorrow right where you live? That it would touch down at exactly 3.17 p.m. and I told you the exact path it would take. You would, of course, prepare. 
you would talk with your loved ones and you'd make a plan today. It's true, I can't tell you a tornado will strike tomorrow, but shouldn't you have a plan anyway? Go to ready.gov slash communicate and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media, the future of broadcasting. Explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. Wizard of Oz is 80 years old. No, I can't. <laughs> I mean, and that movie, that movie, it, it is impeccable how the quality of that film, it surpasses many films made in the seventies. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I, and I, I, I have, I have a, a vivid memory of when it goes from black and white into color, mm-hmm. you know, when she opens the door and I mean, and the, the special effects that they were using at that time were, groundbreaking really i mean there's cg movies nowadays that look worse than that oh for sure for sure <laughs> you know and and uh, i've read all sorts of wonderful stories about the you know the shenanigans that went on when they were making them mm-hmm. yep and margaret hamilton who played uh, uh, the wicked witch nearly dying i remember um, that yeah. when she went up in the in the pub of smoke she actually caught fire and was burned severely wow. uh, and was they had to stop filming for months well, she recovered. So, I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, things weren't perfect in no. 1939. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's just a wonderful memory for me when I was a child. So, Yeah, I love that. Now, now, tell me, how did you get involved with Who Framed Roger Rabbit? I was originally seen to play one of the humans in the film. Oh, really? I'd gone out to uh, L Street. I, I was living in, in, in the UK at the time because the, the entire film was, was shot in the UK. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I've sp- I spent most, I, I mean, I'm now living in the United States, but uh, I spent most of my adult life and working life living and working in the UK. I had just been out in Los Angeles knocking around looking for work and nothing was going on. And, and uh, uh, I had done a... Um, I had done a television commercial in England for uh, for Eastern Airlines. It was a, the president of Eastern Airlines at its when it eventually went under was uh, um, Frank Borman, who was one of the uh, um, uh, original astronauts. But they had started this London Miami route. They were doing commercials for them, and I was very very lucky to uh, I got cast doing a, a commercial for Eastern Airlines advertising their London Miami route. And I had done one commercial, and um, I was out in L.A. sitting around spinning my wheels and nothing was going on. And my agent in London called me and said, um, look, they want to do a second commercial with the character that you did for, East, uh, for your Eastern Airlines commercial. And uh, she says, I, I told them that you're in Los Angeles. Uh, and they said, well, we'll fly him back to do the commercial. We're an airline. <laughs> we can do that. You yeah. know, so. They, she said, do you want to come back and do the commercial? And and I'd been knocking around in L.A. for, I guess, for about three or four months and nothing was going on. And I I said to my agent, I said, well, yeah, I said, I'll, I'll do the commercial and you can tell them to make it a one way ticket. <laughs> uh, they don't have to fly me back to L.A. And uh, I'll come back and do the commercial. And uh, because I still had uh, uh, I still had an apartment in London, and I didn't give that up. And about two weeks after I did that commercial, my agent then called me and said, um, you got an audition for this film that they're doing called Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Uh, go along on such and such a day is, uh, um, to meet Robert Zemeckis, who I, you know, I was in awe of, you know, because he'd done, you know, like all the Back to the Future course, stuff yeah. and, 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 all, and all that. And I said, wow, you know, so, so I'd gone along to meet him and um, uh, I was auditioning to play one of the humans in the film. We we had a good meeting and and uh, and I left and I went home and uh, this was this you have to remember that this was in mid eighties so this was before the days of cell phones <laughs> uh, and and, um, and I got back to my uh, uh, apartment in in London and and um, I could hear my phone ringing I lived like on the top floor of a three story building and I could hear my phone ringing. Uh, in in my apartment, it was ringing, ringing off the wall, and I ran up the stairs and 
grab, grab the phone. It was my agent. She says, oh, I've been trying to ring you for ages. She says, I've uh, uh, just been on the phone with the uh, um, uh, um, casting director uh, um, for this Roger Rabbit thing that you went for. And uh, Robert Zemeckis doesn't think that you're right for any of the humans in the film, but he, he loves your voice. Interesting. Do you, do you, do you want to voice the baby? And <laughs> I said, sure. <laughs> I, I, I've never done anything like that yeah. before. <laughs> you know? So I, 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 I said yes, and uh, uh, and um, I mean I didn't have to go for costume fittings or anything like that. Yeah. I just had to wait until they started shooting. <laughs> you know, you know they send me bits of script, and uh, it, it, every time they sent me a bit of script, it, it was like it was like signing the Official Secrets Act. You 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 know you had to sign for everything, and everything was under cloak and dagger, and you know this is like uh, uh, very secretive. You were, and I wasn't allowed to tell anybody that I was doing this film. It, it, it was a bit surreal. I mean, I, I, um, I've said this in other uh, interviews as well. I mean, my very, very first day on the set, I walked on and, and was introduced to a couple of people and uh, then uh, introduced to, uh, uh, to Charlie Fleischer, mm -hmm. who uh, um, did Roger's voice. And um, he was wearing Roger's costume. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and which, I, which took me aback a bit, you know, and and the first thing that popped into my head was, geez, I, I hope they're not going to ask me to wear a diaper, <laughs> you know, because if they do, I'm I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, you know, obviously that wasn't I mean, he obviously was doing it because he, he felt he needed to be wearing Roger's clothes to get him into character. Yeah, and stuff it's like, it's that. like a and it's like a method actor for a voice actor, which I've never yeah, heard of before. Yeah, I mean, that was fine. You know, if you Charlie wanted to do that. Was, but, then, you know, there's no way that I was going to be doing that from for for for, <laughs> for myself. But uh, um, that was kind of my introduction on the set was, you know, seeing you know, Charlie dressed as Roger. Mm -hmm. and thinking, wow, this is going to be a weird job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it, it turned out to be great fun. So. And what I love about this film is that unlike any other film like it, you guys who are just voices, you could easily have just gone behind the microphone in post-production and done your, you know, your scenes and everything, but you were actually there on the set with the actors. And so they can play off of your voices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything was we shot our everything was live. I mean, uh, um, we we were on set, uh, um, you know, obviously on the other side of the camera. And, and uh, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, that was my phone. Going off. <laughs> uh, I, when, when I get a, a text message, I actually have Bugs Bunny uh, <laughs> give great. me a message that I have a, a text <laughs> message. I'll, I'll look at that later. But sorry, yeah, I got, I got uh, uh, off track there. But uh, um we we you know we were told that we were going to come and do our voices live with everybody and and uh, that's the way they were going to shoot it it was it was a wonderful way to do it but it was really really tiring because we did everything 50 times mm -hmm. uh, cuz uh, um robert zemeckis was was a, a perfectionist he had it in his mind's eye as to how he wanted to see it even though we couldn't see it you know but what 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 they did was is that they made up uh, little dolls, actual physical dolls of of the cartoon characters and would put them into the scenes and we would rehearse with the dolls in uh, so that the actors working with the with the cartoon characters could get it in their mind's eye as to you know uh, how big you know where where their eye line should be and everything okay. like that. They always they call those scenes reference scenes, uh, and so we would we would shoot with the doll in, or we we would actually film it with the doll in, uh, and and also rehearse with it, and then they would take the dolls out, and then we would shoot the scene, and you know like Bob Hoskins would be literally acting to thin air, yep, and then uh, they would the following morning they would go and look at the rushes. And, and they would put the, the reference scenes with the dolls uh, next to the scene, to, to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the formal scenes without the dolls in and match them up to see if the eye lines looked right. Oh, wow. And if they didn't look right, we would go back and do it again, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which we had to do quite a few times because, you know, uh, I mean, but I read something somewhere that by the end, Bob Hoskins was uh, uh, hallucinating. I remember reading that too. Yep. Because he, he, he just, you know, he, 
he didn't know what was real and what wasn't. Mm-hmm. You know. Dear John, I'm leaving. Uncontrolled high blood pressure is serious, and I can quit whenever I want. Why can't we get back to when you checked on me? I don't want to leave. But remember, when I quit, you quit. Sincerely, your heart. Listen to your heart and don't let it quit on you. High blood pressure can lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range today. For help keeping yours at a healthy range, text PRESSURE to 97779. A message from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio. Take one. Behold the angry giant. Try it again, Alberto. Behold the angry giant. Perfect. Good luck tonight. Behold the angry giant. Yay! Read me another one, Dad. This is WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. Feedthepig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to sell all your belongings and live in a commune. These dungarees belong to all of us now, Tom. You don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. We need a new stuntman! You just need FeedThePig.org. Don't get left behind. Get tips and tools at FeedThePig.org. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Now more than ever, family matters, and Surratt Law Practice has your family in mind. Kimberly Surratt and her team have been helping maintain healthy families through their holistic approach to adoption and surrogacy, child custody, estate planning, and more for over 13 years. Your family law concerns are in caring hands with Surratt Law. Schedule your private consultation with a compassionate Surratt Law practice team member today by calling 775-636-8200 or visiting lawyersforfamilies.com. Surratt Law, where family matters. The storks are bringing me a baby brother! We can do this! Together. All right, let's go. Storks know how to keep kids safe. Do you? What? Oh, my gosh, you don't know. <gasps> I know. You don't. <laughs> oh, man, you laugh when you're uncomfortable. <laughs> no. Making sure your child is in the right car seat is one of the steps to safer travel. I will rock this. You will rock this. To know for sure that your child is in the right car seat for their age and size, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. Cool, cool, cool. Very cool, very cool. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. It's important to plan ahead for emergencies. Like, like the storm. storm. When, when it, it kicked in, in we had we a were plan. Separated. We, we were, were able to get in touch with each other in no time. Idea how to find each other. The, the whole experience, experience was, was the most frightening 10 hours of my life. If, if there's, there's one, one piece of advice I'd offer other moms, moms out there, there, it's to stay it's calm and keep to the plan. Message. Some parents plan ahead. Some don't. Make sure you know where to find your family in an emergency. Start your plan at ready.gov. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media, the future of broadcasting. Listen live at phoenixmedia.us. My very, very first day on the set, I only found this is something, uh, I don't think I've ever mentioned this to anybody in an interview before, so you get an exclusive There you go. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, um, the, my very, very first day on the set, we started to rehearse. The, the, the first scene that we shot was the scene with the uh, baby Herman in his baby carriage, mm-hmm. with the uh, you know with the tall leg, leggy blonde and and, uh, um, and and Bob Hoskins. And um, so we started to rehearse the scene, and um, I started to do my lines, and and all of a sudden this this man came running out of nowhere, running up to me, and and said. And went just went. Now I know how to draw him, and he walked away. <laughs> and I remember saying to the uh, um, to the sound engineer, I said, "Who is that?" And they said, "That's Richard Williams. He's the <laughs> chief animator. Uh-huh. He, you know, he he created these characters." And I went, "Oh, I had met him." And what I found out, and I only found this out a couple of years ago, that he he loved Baby Herman, and and uh, um, he drew every single frame. A baby Herman himself. Hmm. He didn't. He never let any of the other animators touch the baby. So every every single frame in the film was hand drawn by him. Wow! I only found this out a couple of years ago. You know, I was quite flattered. 
because he wasn't sure how he should draw him until he eventually heard me. Oh, that's great. So you really, truly inspired what we see on the screen. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, because what was funny was, is that, I mean, I wasn't given any kind of uh, um, direction as to how the baby should sound. I, mean, I remember when I first read the script, the description of the baby in the script was, he looks like a baby, but he's 50 years old and he <laughs> smokes a cigar and he sounds like Wallace Beery. I don't know if you know who Wallace Beery is. I was. don't. I don't he, think I do. He was an old time actor in the 30s who had a really, really gruff voice. Okay. And I thought, oh, okay. You know, and uh, um, so I, I, I kind of developed this voice. But uh, um, but the voice that I used in in the film was a combination of that. And it was a, a combination of um, my friends imitating me. Um, because I lived <laughs> in the UK, 99% um, of my friends were, were British. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this. This is something else that I didn't know for years. But they used to imitate me all the time uh, <laughs> and, um, because I had such a, a loud, gruff voice. Mm -hmm. But they, if, if they were sort of saying something to somebody about me, they wouldn't say, oh, Lou said so-and-so. They would go, my, one of my friends, my good friend James Saxon, who unfortunately died a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, he wouldn't say, oh, Lou said so-and-so. He would go, Lou said, blah, 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 you know, and he was just, you know, and, <laughs> and so I was kind of imitating them, imitating me. That's great. The combination of that and the description of what the baby was supposed to sound like in, that was written in the script. That's how the kind of that's the, how the character developed. And and the only the only direction Robert Zemeckis ever gave me in all the time that I was on the film was he always used to say to me, "Talk faster." He used to say, "Cartoons talk faster than humans." He says, "Just speed up your dialogue." Huh. A bit. You know, and that's the only thing he ever said to me. It was his, wow. uh, um, um, and practically everything that we did on set stayed in the film. I think I, I only had to I had, I had to post sync one line uh, uh, in the film because there was some background noise that they couldn't get okay. rid of. And um, I arrived at the studio. It was one of the biggest disappointments in my life because when I got there, the the sound engineer who I had known as I had worked with him on some other stuff. When I got there, he said. He says, oh, he says, I wish you'd come five minutes earlier. He says, you just missed Mel Blanc. Oh, God. And I was crushed because, <sighs> I mean, you know, I, I, I knew he was doing stuff on the film. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but he, was, he, was, he wasn't around. I think, he, I think he did most of his stuff post-sync. I don't think I he think was so. ever. I'm not sure so. if he was ever actually on the set. Oh, God, that would have um, been amazing to meet him. And plus, I think it's his last performance, I believe. Yes. Yes, it was. I mean, uh, um, I always remember. I don't know if you ever saw the uh, um, the obituary that uh, um, uh, Warner Brothers put in the newspapers for I don't, him. Have I don't you think, ever seen that? I don't think I have. It's 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 wonderful. It's uh, um, it, it chokes me up when I think about it. Actually, it's all the Warner Brothers characters standing in a line with oh, their yeah. heads bowed. Yeah, I have seen and that. There's a, a microphone with a spotlight on it, mm -hmm. and and underneath it just says "speechless." Yep, I remember seeing that. Wonderful, and it, it was weird actually because he actually died the 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 same day as Laurence Olivier. Wow! And um, you know there was all this stuff in the papers about Laurence Olivier, blah 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 blah, and not that much about Mel Blanc. And I just mm -hmm. thought, you know, that's not right. I said mm -hmm. because there's probably more people in the world know who Bugs Bunny was. Oh yeah, for sure. People <laughs> have, people have heard <laughs> him know? way more times than most other actors out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, uh, and and what a what a vocal genius he was. And I, I was just I, I felt so bad that I didn't get didn't get the chance to meet him. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, um, just and just missed him. You know, but that's that's life, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, not just him. I mean, there was like June Foray, Pat Buttram, uh, yeah. May, May Questel, who was, uh, of course, Betty Boop. So many amazing voices on that movie. Yeah, I mean, and uh, they, they, you know, it was also the first time that Warner Brothers characters and, and Disney characters ever appeared on film together. Uh-huh, yep. Uh, um, which was a major coup, you know, for, for, for the, uh, uh, the producers and stuff. Not, you know, not to mention all the, you know, the new characters that were created for the film, but all the Warner Brothers characters and all the, all the Disney characters, everybody was in this film, yep. you know, which, which I think is why it became such a classic.
Yep. I, I no, heard no. recently, maybe a couple of years ago, I heard Warner Brothers, like the number one thing they wanted from this movie in order to put their characters into this movie was that their main characters had equal screen time as the Disney characters. And that's mm. why you see like uh, Mickey and Bugs skydiving together. You yeah. Know, equal screen time. Yeah. Yeah. But then, and then they were quite happy to give it to them, I think. I mean, this is, you know, then it was, uh, it was just great to see all those characters together. I mean, uh, um, um, it, it was a major coup for all the people involved, you know, Spielberg mm-hmm. and, and, uh, I think, uh, um, Oh, I can't remember the guy. Well, there was one producer. Uh, I can't remember his name. It was a lovely man, and I can't remember his name now. But he was responsible for getting all this together and stuff. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And it was just great to be a part of that. I, I was I was fortunate to to be on the on the shoot on the very very last day of of filming because we actually shot the the opening scene last. Okay. Uh, you know where where the refrigerator falls mm-hmm. on Roger and he sees birds instead of stars and and, and, and <laughs> baby Herman goes off in a huff and everything like that. We actually that was the last scene that was shot in the film. Then we had a big rap party on the set. I'd never seen so much champagne in my life, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I actually got quite inebriated uh, uh, um, on, on, on the day and. Um, it was in the days where I used to have a driver. He used to pick me up, bring me to the set, and drive me home. Uh, at the end of the day, the driver was waiting for me, and I, I mean, I was sozzled. We were driving back into London, and I said, uh, oh, I, I want to go to my local pub and see my friends, you know. So the driver said, sure, and he drove me to the pub, and I, I said, I won't be long, you know. I just walked in. I walked into the pub, and I had this, silly grin on my face and it was I mean as I told you earlier I had, you know I we weren't allowed to tell anybody about uh-huh. the film uh-huh. and I but I walked into the pub and I had this silly grin on my face and one of my friends said to me where have you been and I went making history <laughs> <laughs> and and that's all I, I couldn't say anything else uh, but it was uh, it, it was a wonderful experience and uh, when we went they, they when the film was eventually cut together, they had a, a, a cast and crew screening uh, uh, in London. They had to have it over two days because the crew was so big on the film; they couldn't fit the whole crew in the wow. in the theater uh, uh, in one in one sitting. I remember seeing a couple of the other guys uh, that had done voices along with me at, at, at the screening. I, I saw this one guy, and uh, I said, "Oh, you!" He was playing uh, one of a, a fairly large part in it, one of the cartoon characters. And I said, "I said, oh, you must be really excited." And he, and he said, "I'm not in the film anymore." Huh. And I, I said, "Well, what do you mean?" He says, uh, "They revoiced me," and I got scared. Cause oh thought, God, yeah. You know, because I I brought my girlfriend and her two children to, to the screening, and I thought, "Oh gosh, I'm going to be really embarrassed here," you know. <laughs> Uh, thankfully, I mean, uh, they, they they hadn't re- I, I, they hadn't revoiced me because uh, I mean I, I guess they would have told me that prior to it, you know. But what I found out was that I, I'm the I think I'm the only person, the only actor who did a voice in London, uh, that uh, of of sort of the the, the smaller characters. It didn't mm-hmm. get revoiced oh, wow. when it went into post production because huh. all of a sudden, you know, obviously the word got out when it got back to L.A., you know, and all of a sudden all these actors were going, I want to do a voice. I want to mm-hmm. do a voice, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and a lot of people, everybody apart from me um, got revoiced. Hmm. Uh, um, so I was I was very lucky. I, I, I was, you know, I guess I was lucky Richard Williams liked me so much. <laughs> <laughs> Allison is perfect. I mean, she'd never tell you that. She's humble and perfect. She likes everyone. She even likes her untidy roommate's weird guinea pig. Allison, wait, are you texting and driving? Allison, no, that's the exact opposite of what I was just saying about you. Why, Allison, why? Texting and driving makes good people look bad. Visit StopTechStopRex.org, brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. I'm Paul George of the Indiana Pacers. When I was six, my days were spent playing basketball. When I was six, my dream was to make it to the NBA. 
When I was six, my mom had a stroke. So I want you to learn to spot a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. I'm Paul George. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. I spend a lot of time in the backyard, and I'm the center of attention at summer barbecues. In 96, I made some of the tastiest s'mores. And at 09, it was me, your backyard fire pit, that accidentally started a wildfire when a summer breeze carried one of my embers into some dry brush. Spark a change, not a wildfire. Visit SmokeyBear.com, brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Only you can prevent wildfires. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. (laughs) Hey, everyone. Let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see, every moment can be kind of special. But they could be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments, it doesn't matter. Because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. You're listening to Phoenix Media. Listen live and explore more great shows at phoenixmedia.us. I even hear that in the beginning stages, Paul Rubens was attached to the voice Roger before Charles came. That I didn't know. Mm-hmm. That I didn't know. I mean, um, that would have been interesting. That would have been. <laughs> actually, if you, if, you, if you go to YouTube, there's some test footage of, of what he recorded. It's on YouTube. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, God. oh, well, I'll take a look at that this afternoon. That That's interesting. I'd never known that. that that's, a, that's a new one on me, Tim. Oh, there you go. I heard it was like many years before um, production came across with, with your version of Roger Rabbit. It's going to be a much different story. So they went with a different voice actor for that. Right, right. But it, it, I think, you know, what, what Charlie did was was, oh, was yeah. great. Oh, it's know? amazing. I, I couldn't see anybody else doing that. No, 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 and and he did a couple of I, he did Benny the Cab as well. Now I heard that you were supposed to be Benny at first, right? Is that what I read correctly? No, no, I don't think they ever okay. asked me to be. I don't, I don't recall that. I, I, I remember, I remember after we did, um, after we did Roger Rabbit, they had me test for voices for Lion King. Oh, um, but. They 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 decided that you know my voice was it was just too recognizable and yeah. they didn't <laughs> they didn't want to use it. And it's a shame, really, because because one of my friends that I actually went to college with did uh, uh, Pumbaa's voice. Uh, I went to college with Ernie Sabella. Oh, uh, so cool! Uh, uh, and uh, um, we you know we we were friends in college, and uh, um, would have would have been nice to have worked worked with him again and, and, and he's gone on to do some wonderful oh, stuff yeah, yeah. as well so uh, do you know um, who you tested for for lion king anybody in particular i can't i can't remember uh, um i think it might have been it might have been like for one of one of the orangutans i think or something i'm I, i'm not really sure it's that long ago mm-hmm. uh, because they they tested me they they were running the tests when um because we got we we did three uh, six-minute shorts that went out in front of feature films. Mm-hmm. Yep. It was while I, I had gone in to, to record one of those 
that they decided to test me for Lion King. But it, it's it's so long ago, I, I, oh, I yeah. can't remember. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I remember going in to, to do my recordings for, uh, um, for the three shorts. And... Um, they would never the, the Disney people would never they never wouldn't call me Lou. They, they, they would they would only they would call me baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd be in the, I'd be in a studio in London and they were in L.A. They, we were doing all the recordings via phone patch and stuff like that. They, you know, I get, get in the studio and they go, good morning, baby. You know, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> yeah. And and they go, oh, you know, baby, we, we don't like that line. We 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 want to change the line. So uh, um, go and have a cup of coffee, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll come back. And I said, okay, you know, I don't care. I'd sit around with the engineer and have you know copious cups of coffee while they rewrote a line, you know. And they come back and say, okay, baby, we're ready now. Here, and then we'll fax you the line, and, and, mm-hmm. and that's how we did it, you know. So I never knew what any of the the little shorts were going to look like until they were actually uh, mm. produced. So those were all, you know, they weren't shot the way we shot the feature film. Yeah, so. much different, much different. Now, now back to the original, we were talking about being cut and everything. Some of your friends were cut from being voices. Was there anything cut from Baby Herman? Were there more scenes in the script that were supposed to be shot but weren't shot or any deleted scenes you actually did record? Not not that I recall, but uh, um, I always remember reading stuff that are that because I think in the original book that that Gary K. Wolf wrote mm-hmm. that that Baby Herman actually Baby Herman was the villain, but they obviously decided that that's not the way they wanted it to go, and so uh, uh, but I don't re- I don't recall um, being given any scenes and then being told that uh, uh, they weren't going to uh, uh, shoot those. Okay. Uh, uh, not not to my memory, man. but you know it was thirty years ago. So uh, I, I know, you know what you mean. <laughs> you know, I I, I I I could my memory might not be as good as I think it is. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's ever a sequel, which I hope there is, I mean, there's been rumors on it and everything. Hopefully, we get to see you come back as Baby Herman. Well, I, I would be, I would love to actually, but you know what the funny thing is, is that in a way, I'm kind of glad that it that they don't do a sequel. I can see where you're coming from. Exactly. I mean, it's a classic. You don't want to ruin it. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, uh, um, trying to do, do it again. I mean, especially after all this time and, you know, with, with all the CGI stuff, uh, now, because all that stuff didn't exist in, in, mm-hmm. in the mid eighties. Um, I don't see how they could do it and do it with the quality that they did when they did the original. And and I think leaving it as a as a one off mm-hmm. just keeps it as a classic, you know. Certainly, I would love the work, you know. But I, I kind of like it that 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 they never they never did get around. I mean, I'd heard rumors for years. Yep. You know, uh, there was there was even talk when we when we were doing the uh, the six minute shorts, there was there was talk of uh, Baby Herman having his own television series. Oh, wow. And um, all these emails and faxes going back and forth between my agents in London and, and Disney in California. And I th- at the end of the day, I think they just decided that the, uh, uh, the cost was just going to be too much to mm-hmm. do. Because, because when Roger Rabbit was made, it was at that time, I think the most expensive film ever shot. Yeah, it makes sense. Cause I, and I think, if my memory serves me, it cost like something like $60 million or mm-hmm. something like that. And that was 1986 or 87 or whatever, you know. Uh, uh, and now, you know, they're, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on films. Uh, so I can't imagine what it would cost if they were to try to do it again. So. <laughs> Plus to get the rights to all the other studio uh, characters, I'm sure that will yeah. be a pretty penny right there. Yeah, I, I just think it would be too complicated. Uh, um, and... Um, and and when there was this talk of uh, you know maybe having his own series and stuff, they just decided that it was just going to be too expensive, and they just dropped it like a hot potato, mm-hmm. which which I was very uh, upset about. But there was nothing I could do, <laughs> so you know it was like uh, um, I, I I had you know my moment of dreaming of you know wonderful things for for for, for a few <laughs> minutes, and then uh, it all went in the toilet. So. Yeah, spending that paycheck before you even got it. 
Oh yeah, I was spending it already. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> you know, I was you know all the fancy cars and everything. There already, you go. But it didn't happen, so you know. Back to driving a Volkswagen. You know? <laughs> and regarding the sequel, do we really want to see it w- without Bob Hoskins? You know, that's another thing. You know, I mean, uh, um, you know, he he was such an integral part of, of the film. You just couldn't. I, I, who who would who would now play Eddie Valiant? I mean, yeah. you know, they would have, it would have to go off on a completely different tack. Yep, exactly, you know? exactly. And so, in that respect, it wouldn't really be a sequel. You know, mm-hmm. uh, um, so you know. Yep, I completely agree with that. And so, what are you doing these days? What do you keep busy with? Well, I I, I moved back to America um, just a little under two years ago. Um, after spending the better part of my adult life in the UK, and um, things have been quiet, but but it's been that that's been more uh, uh, by choice rather than uh, um, anything else because. You know, I, I bought an, a, a lovely little house, and I've been just sort of getting the house together. Uh, and um, I just decided that, you know, when I'm when I'm ready, when I think, okay, the house is done, then I'll, you know, maybe sort of start to put myself about again, and, mm-hmm. and uh, um, maybe start to do a little work again. But there was a whole series of circumstances in London. And I'm, I had the same agent for nearly 40 years when I lived in London, and uh, and she retired, uh-huh. and all of a sudden. All of a sudden, people were going, "Oh, hey, he's too old." And I thought, "When did I become old?" I don't remember that <laughs> happening, you know. But I guess you do, you know. And and uh, um, the, the 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 frequency of work started to to dwindle, and um, and then Brexit happened, and I thought, "Well, that's the last straw," you know. And um, so I sold my house in uh, um, uh, in London and and decided to move back to America. So that's where I am now. So, well, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a bit of culture shock, I have to say. You know, uh, uh, and I, I do I do miss London, and I, I miss my friends. But um, I just had some. I had only last week. I had visitors from from London come visit me here, yeah. so was, uh, that was nice. So you know, I still keep in touch, and uh, you know, I can always get on a plane and go back. Yep, exactly. So, Lou, I want to seriously thank you so much for your time. I had a great time. This has been a great conversation here it's, it's one of my favorites i think oh it's my pleasure i mean uh, th- I, i'm 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 flattered that you asked me to do this <laughs> well thank you so much and uh is there any way i can have you channel little baby herman to close out the interview this is baby herman you're listening to saturday morning rewind with tim night l the whole thing stinks like yesterday's diapers Thanks for listening to Saturday Morning Rewind. Please check them out on Facebook and Twitter. And that's all, folks.